Hello students, today we are going to study the design of Cypher Aqueduct. That is the second design in module 3 of design. First of all, let us go through the types of cross drainage networks. Here, Cypher Aqueduct comes under the type 1 cross drainage network in which irrigation canal passes over the drainage. So, let us see Cypher Aqueduct in detail. In Cypher Aqueduct, the high flood level of the drain, that is a natural stream, is higher than the canal bed level. See in this figure, this is a natural drain, and we can see that the high flood level of the drain is above the canal bed level. So such a cross drainage work is known as siphon aqueduct, and we are going to design the same in this lecture. Okay, now let us see the design of siphon aqueduct here. This is a figure of siphon aqueduct where this region is known as trough and this region is known as barrel of the siphon aqueduct. We will be using that term barrel during this design and main difference between an aqueduct and a siphon aqueduct is that the HFL will be above the canal bed level. And during the design of aqueduct that we studied in the previous lecture, uh, there are certain differences here. Uh, first one is the number of steps. In aqueduct there was seven steps of design. For siphon aqueduct we have 10 and about 6 steps in the design of siphon aqueduct is same as, the same as in the design of aqueduct. Hence, we will not be going through those steps in detail in this video and other remaining steps we will be learning in detail. Now, we said this region is known as trough and this region is known as barrel and below the trough there will be barrel and below that there will be an impervious floor. We have to design this floor using Bly's theory and that was that we did not do during the design of aqueduct. So this is the impervious floor that we provide for a protection of the bed in the drainage that is for the region below the aqueduct. Now this is the impervious floor and this is a sloping apron that is used to provide a transition from initial bed level to the bed level that is a depressed bed level under the trough. So this is a transition and this is also a transition. So this will be uh, constructed using a range of concrete and here we will be providing a bed protection using stone pitching. So stone pitching is provide, provided to stop the erosion at these points. We know this is a natural drainage or natural river. So there will be soil, soil bed here. To protect that soil bed we will be providing a stone pitching. Okay, cutoff walls are provided on both sides of the apron to prevent scouring. That is here cutoff walls are provided at both sides of the apron that is the impervious floor here there is a cutoff wall, cut wall and here is also a cutoff wall that is to stop the scouring and also to decrease the seepage below this floor also there will be boulder or stone pitching on the upstream side and on the downstream side and sometimes there will be a cutoff wall provided before this before and after the stone pitching also other components like canal trough piers inspection rod etc should be designed according to the methods adopted in case of aqueduct rule. That is, for these components, the design will be same for aqueduct and siphon aqueduct. Okay, this is a design question for the siphon aqueduct. Design a suitable cross drainage work for the following data. Discharge of the canal is given as 40 meter cube per second. Then bed width is given. Full supply depth of the canal is given. Full supply depth FST is full supply depth of the canal given as 1.6 meters, then bed level of the canal 206.4, side slope of the canal that is 1.5 horizontal is to 1 vertical, hence channel is rapisoidal. High flood discharge of the drainage 450 meter cube per second, high flood level of the drainage 207, bed level of the drainage. Now step 1, step 1 is the identification of cross drainage work. Here, canal bed level is given as 206.4 and drainage bed level is equal to 204.5. Hence, canal is above the drainage, that is, therefore, the cross drainage work may be an aqueduct or may be a siphon aqueduct. Now, the high flood level, high flood level is greater than canal bed level in this question. Therefore, it is a siphon aqueduct and we are going to design a siphon aqueduct of type 3. Same as in the case of design of aqueduct. Now step 2. Step 2 is the design of drainage waterway. First we are going to find out the length of the waterway. Same equation as in the design of aqueduct that is P is equal to 4.75 root of Q and Q is the 
discharge in the drainage that is 450 cumex therefore p will be obtained as 100.76 and if you need you can decrease or you can you can reduce your allow to reduce the clear waterway by 20 percentage that okay that is case now now we have to assume the clear span assuming a clear span of 8 meters and width of the pier as 1.5 meters number of bays equal to 100.76 by 8 plus 1.5 same equation i think the gets back correct so you will be getting 11 bays so for number of piers is equal to number of bays minus 1 that's equal to 10 now length of clear waterway that is 11 that is the number of bays multiplied by the width of one bay or clear span that is 8 we assume it as 8 therefore Length of clear waterway is equal to 88 meters, and actual waterway, that is, length of actual waterway width, that is equal to drainage width. That is 8 into 11, that is clear span multiplied by number of bays plus number of piers multiplied by pier width. That is, we will be getting it as 103 meters here. W A is greater than P, therefore the design is safe. now we have to design for the height of the barrel this we did not do in the case of aqueduct so this is new now listen the velocity through the siphon barrel should be limited to 2 meter per second to 3 meter per second so that is the range of velocity through the siphon barrel barrel is a region below the trough of the aqueduct through which the drainage flows so there the flow should be 2 meter per second to 3 meter per second now we are going to assume this velocity as 2 meter per second now we have to find out the area of the barrel required that is discharge divided by velocity discharge is 450 that is given in the question divided by assumed velocity that is 2 we will get area of the barrel required as 225 meter square now height of the barrel that we have to find out that is area of the barrel divided by width of waterway that is width of clear waterway through which the water is flowing we actually we got total drainage width as 103 meters but in that there is the piers will be included in that width now this 88 is a region through which the water flows so that is clear waterway that is 88 that for area of barrel 225 divided by width of waterway that is 88 we'll be getting in as 2.55 meters now actual velocity actual velocity is discharged by actual area therefore actual area is 450 that is the area um, discharge divided by actual area 88 that is the width of clear waterway multiplied by 2.5 we are rounding this value to 2.5 therefore 450 by 88 into 2.5 will be getting it as 2.045 so that is between the range 2 to 3 meter per second and actual velocity through barrel is equal to We will be taking this value as 2.05 meter per second. So, provide 11 rectangular barrels, each of 8 meter width and 2.5 meter height. Now, 11 rectangular barrels. That means there will be 11 clear spans. That is the entire width of the drainage. We are dividing it into 11 barrels. That is each two piers. Two pier will be the total number of piers will be ten. Therefore, the gap between two piers that is known as one barrel. So there will there will be eleven rectangular barrels with eight meter width. That is the width of that is the clear span that we have assumed. So eight meter eight meter width and two point five meter height. Okay. Now here we took the height of the barrel two point five five meter. We round it off as rounded it off as 2.5 meters. That is less than this value. That is because if you round this 2.55 to 2.6, when you find out the actual velocity, that value will be around 1.9 something. So that is the velocity, actual velocity obtained when the height of the barrel is assumed as 2.6 meters will be will not be in this range. That is. the value this value that we obtained when 
the height of the barrel is 2.6 is around 1.9 something so that will not be in this range that is why we assumed this 2.5 by 2 2.5 that is a value less than this value now let, let's move on to the next step so not the next step this is what we have designed here let us see this is a HFL that is given as 207 meters and also the hybrid level will be different for upstream side and downstream side in the question if it is not specified as HFL of upstream side and HFL of downstream side if there is only one value given take it as the HFL of downstream side that is 207 meters now canal bed level is 206.4 and we found out the height of the barrel this is the height of the barrel that is is equal to 2.5 meters now we can see the water level or the difference between the canal bed level and the drainage bed level that is 1.9 meters that is difference between canal bed level and drainage bed level that is 206.4 minus 204.5 that is equal to 1.9 meter only that is this height is 1.9 meter only now the height of the barrel that we found out was 2.5 meters that is greater than this difference hence we have to provide a depressed floor here that is we have to depress the or increase the depth from original drainage depth to the depth that we have to provide for the barrel that is 2.5 here it is 1.9 only so we have to depress the floor to 2.5 meter to obtain 2.5 meter depth so here this is a depressed floor and for this design we are providing a vertical drop here we are not going to provide an upstream sloping apron we are providing only one downstream sloping apron that is for the transition from this level to this level and we are providing one downstream cutoff pipe okay now step 3 step 3 is the design of canal waterway and this is same as in the case of the design of aqueduct there are uh, there will be we are going to design the transition from 30 meters to 50 meters and then 50 meters to back to the original width that is 30 meters now let us see normal bed width of the canal is given 30 meters so let the width be reduced to 15 meters we are going to reduce from 30 to 15 that is we have seen the range is around uh, range of production is 50 percentage now providing a supply of 2 2 is to 1 in contraction that is same as in the previous case we are going to provide a rate of contraction here as 2 is to 1 so the width will be reduced to 15 meters from 30 to 15 now the length of the contraction length of the contraction is equal to 2 into 30 minus 15 by 2 that is 15 meters and similarly for providing a supply of 3 is to 1 for expansion from 15 meters to 30 meters the length will be 3 that is this 3 3 multiplied by 3 into 30 minus 15 by 2 that is equal to 22.5 also the length of the plumed rectangular portion that is the length of this portion that we have earlier found out it is 103 meters that is the width of the drainage that we have found out using the equation of p and now let's move on okay there is one more thing now we are uh, we are going to divide this entire figure into four sections that is section 1 1 section 2 2 that is section 1 1 is the section before contraction this is section after contraction now this is the third 3 3 is a section at the start of expansion and 4 4 is a section at the end of expansion now step 4 is a design of bed levels at different sections as in the previous design of aqueduct we are going to design or we are going to go back from section 4 to 1 now section at 4 4 the canal returns to its normal section that is at the end of the expansion all conditions are known that is area at that point area at that point will be sub, uh, that will be area cross section a and that the cross section is trapezoidal and the dimensions of the trapezoid are given in the question so there will be bed width of 30 then depth of canal is 1.6 and side slopes are given as 1.5 horizontal is to 1 vertical so you can find out the area at section 4 a4 that is obtained as 51.84 meters 
hence velocity is equal to discharge by area that is 40 that is the discharge in the canal divided by area obtained so v4 is 0.771 meter per second now the velocity head at that point is v4 square by 2g that is 0 0.77 square by 2 into 9.81 you will be getting it as 0 0.3 meters now canal bed level is given as 206.4 therefore full supply level in the canal that is canal bed level plus canal full supply depth of the canal that is given in the question is 1.6 therefore full supply level is equal to 208.208 meters therefore reduced level of total energy line at section 4 that is SSL of the canal plus kinetic head or kinetic loss that is equal to 208 plus 0 0.03 therefore reduced level of total energy line at section 4 is equal to 208.03 meters now at section 3 we have head loss is equal to 0 0.3 into v3 square minus v4 square by 2g And this equation is equation for energy loss due to expansion transition that is expansion from section 3 3 to section 4 4 the energy loss between that expansion is given by this equation you will be getting it as 0 0.0335 meters you know the velocity at v3 that is v3 square sorry v3 can be obtained by dividing the discharge by area of cross section discharge in the canal is 40 area of cross section is 15 into 1.6 that is 15 is a plumed width and we know that at section 3 the cross section is rectangular therefore area is equal to depth into depth is 1.6 that is in the canal multiplied by the width of the plumed portion so you will be getting it as 1.67 now kinetic loss kinetic loss or kinetic head is equal to v3 square by 2g that is equal to 0 0.142 therefore ssl at section 3 is equal to total energy line at 3 minus v3 square by 2 that is 208.064 minus 0 0.142 you will be getting in as 207.922 meters now canal bed level canal bed level is ssl minus depth of the canal that is 1.6 you will be getting in as 206.32 now moving from now moving from section 3 to section and that is calculated here this is same as in the case of design of aqueduct so you will be getting the total energy line at section 2 as 208.115 meters therefore FSL is total energy line minus kinetic head so you get what it is 207.973 and canal bed level at section 2 is equal to FSL at section 2 minus D that is equal to 206.373 meters here at section 1 1 reduced level of total energy line is equal to reduced level of total energy line at section 2 plus head loss due to the contraction which we have found out in the or this is same as in the case of design of aqueduct simply find out the head loss that is equal to 0 0.022 meters and total energy line at section 1 then after that FSL FSL at section 1 is equal to total energy line at section 1 minus the head loss that is 0 0.022 not head loss that is a kinetic head v1 square by 2g that is 0 0.03 therefore canal bed level is equal to ssl minus depth of the canal that will be obtained as 206 point now these are the values at uh, values of canal bed level full supply level and total energy line at section 1 2 3 and 4 now design of transitions this is also same as in the case of aqueduct we have mithras hyperbolic equation so for contraction transition bn is a normal bed width that is 30 that is reduced to 15 so bf is a plumed width and length of the transition that is length of contraction is 15 
now bn 30 is normal width then l is the length of transition minus x into 30 minus 15 that is bn minus bs so you will be getting the equation as bx is equal to 450 by 30 minus x now for substituting different values of x from 0 to 15 you will be getting the values of bx and similarly for the case of expansion now design of truss this is also same as in the case of aqueduct and for every design these values will be same and finally as after assuming the values for outer wall then these are the partition walls 0 0.3 and 0 these two are the partition walls and this is another outer wall and we have also assumed the depth of the canal bed floor so total width of the trough you will be obtaining it as 0 0.4 plus 5 plus 0 0.3 plus 5 plus 0 0.3 plus 5 plus 0 0.4 that is 16.4 meters 16.4 meters will be the overall width of the trough now there is one more thing in the earlier question that is in the design of aqueduct we have designed the trough or we have designed the aqueduct into two compartments here we are dividing it into three that is there is plumbed waterway which is 15 meters we are taking it as three uh, compartments of five meter depth each and we will be also providing an inspection rod on the left extreme compartment that is here now head loss through siphon barrel this is a new thing we haven't studied this in the case of design of aqueduct here we have an equation known as unwinds equation which in which there are certain terms f1 f2 etc f1 is equal to 0 0.505 f2 is equal to a into 1 plus b by r where a and b are also constants and a is a hydraulic radius now let us see here hydraulic radius is equal to a by p that is area of the barrel divided by wetted perimeter now here here we are considering only one barrel and we have said earlier that there are total 11 number of barrels and we are taking the case of one single barrel which has a width of 8 meters that is a clear span that we have assumed and depth 2.5 meters that we found out earlier so this is one barrel and a is equal to 8 into 2.5 and wetted perimeter now there is one difference here that is in earlier or in case of open channel flow wetted perimeter will be 2.5 plus 8 plus 2.5 that is the top width we will not be considering to find out the wetted perimeter for open channel flow but here we know the flow is pressurized in the barrel that is in the siphon barrel the flow is pressurized and hence the water will be flowing full and hence wetted perimeter will be the entire perimeter itself that is 8 plus 8 plus 2.5 plus 2.5 hence r is equal to a by p that is area is 2.5 into 8 divided by total perimeter that is 8 plus 8 plus 2.5 plus 2.5 so you will be getting r is equal to 0 0.952 now substituting all the values in this equation you will get unwind situation that is head loss through the siphon barrel as 0 0.33 meters now hfl that is in this question high flood level and the drainage is not specified for upstream side and downstream side hence we will be taking the given value as hfl at the up, at the downstream side hence downstream hfl is equal to 207 meters hence upstream hfl will be is equal to downstream hfl plus loss through the siphon barrel hence 207 plus 0 0.33 that's equal to 207.33 step 8 that is the design of roof barrel here we are going to design the roof of the barrel portion that is in this figure see this is the trough of the aqueduct and this is the barrel of the aqueduct that is we are going to design this slab that is this roof of the barrel portion of the, of the aqueduct now for the design there are two worst conditions that is first when the trough is empty that is this region is empty and this region is flowing full that is there is uplift acting on this slab there is an upward force from here Okay, there is an upward force in this direction acting on the slab and the only downward force acting is the 
sulfate of the trough and there is no water in the trough now the net value of these two forces that is one upward that is uplift and sulfate of the sulfate of the trough so the net force that comes here we have to design this slab to carry that net load that is a net uplift now that is the first condition now second condition is when water load acting and there is no uplift that is in that case okay in that case water will be flowing full in the trough and there will not be any water in the barrel portion of the aqueduct or there will be open channel flowing conditions prevailing in the barrel that is the water is not touching the roof slab of the barrel now let us see the first condition uplift pressure on roof barrel we are going to find out the uplift pressure on the roof barrel now the rl of the bottom of the trough that is for this slab the bottom of the trough means for this red slab the rl of the bottom line of this red slab that is rl of the canal bed that is rl of this point minus thickness of the slab thickness of the slab is thickness of this red slab that is 0.4 we have assumed it in the previous steps that is 206.4 minus 0.4 that is equal to 206 meter that is rl of the bottom of this red slab is 206 meters now log of head at entry that is entry log is equal to 0 0.5505 v square by 2v Now the head causing uplift on the roof slab that is head is expressed in meters of water. Now head causing uplift is equal to upstream HFL that is 207.33 minus entry loss 0 0.108 minus bottom level of roof slab. This value we found out it earlier and this value is given. So that is 1.222 meters of water. Now uplift force that is equal to this head multiplied by specific weight of water that is 1.222 into 10,000 newton per meter cube you have to so see the units that is 1.222 meters into 10,000 newton per meter cube so you will be getting the value of 12,200 20 newton per mm square that is equal to 12.22 kilo newton per mm square so that is a uplift force acting on the roof slab due to water now the downward force acting when trough is empty is the weight of the roof slab which is 0.4 meter thick now weight of slab per unit area that is a specific weight of concrete into thickness that is 24 we are taking the specific weight of concrete as 24 kilo newton per meter cube into 0.4 meter that we have assumed the thickness of the roof slab that is equal to 9.6 into sorry 9.6 kilo newton per meter square now the balance uplift pressure that is uplift force we found out it as 12.22 minus the downward force that is the weight of the slab so 12.22 minus 9.6 2.62 kilo newton per meter square hence this 2.62 kilo newton per meter square has to be resisted by the extra reinforcement provided at top of the roof slab so we are resisting this uplift pressure this balance uplift pressure by providing extra reinforcement on the top of the roof slab and see if this weight of the slab provided is greater than 12.22 that is 12.22 minus this value is greater than this value that is therefore the balance uplift pressure becomes negative so in that case you will not have to provide additional reinforcement this when this value is positive you have to provide reinforcement force to resist that value now let's move on now for the second case when water load is acting and there is no uplift that is there is no uplift force on the roof slab of the barrel and there is a water load acting from the top 
so there is a downward force so downward water load is equal to depth into specific weight of water that is depth of water in the canal that is 1.6 into specific weight is 10,000 newton per meter cube so we will be getting in the 16 kilo newton per meter square and load due to self weight of the slab that is also acting downward we have found it out earlier that is 9.6 kilo newton per meter square therefore total downward force is 16 plus 9.6 25.6 hence suitable reinforcement should be provided at the bottom of the slab to resist the force of 25.6 that is when the barrel is empty or when the barrel is in open channel flowing conditions that is the main point when the barrel is in open channel conditions there will not be any uplift force acting on the roof of the barrel so that is the condition here water load is acting that is there is water in the canal and there is no uplift force from the uplift force due to the water flowing in the barrel step 9 is the design of bottom floor of the barrel for that we are considering two heads that is first one is static head and then featured head and here the static head is due to the water table rise up which takes place up to the drainage bed level as the floor is depressed below the turf that means we know that the floor here the floor section of the drainage is or the bed of the drainage is depressed below the turf and due to this depression water table will be rising up to the bed level for this region that is water level will be rising up to this dotted line here so there will be a static head of water due to the rise of water table now we have to find out that head first for that reduce level of barrel floor that is the floor of the barrel that is this line reduce level of that line is rl of trough bottom that is rl of this line 206 minus height of barrel that is 2.5 therefore you will be getting enough 2.3.5 now we are going to assume a thickness of 0.8 meter for this bottom slab therefore rl of bottom of the floor that is for this line oh, the rl is 203.5 that is rl of this line minus thickness so you will be getting the rl of this line as 202.7 now bed level of the drain is 204.5 therefore we are going to assume that the water table will be rising up to this dot line that is the bed level of the drain and hence the static uplift on the floor will be equal to 204.5 minus 202.7 that is 1.8 meter of water so static up static head this static head 1.8 meters is the reason for uplift on this depressed floor or uplift on the barrel now second one we said in the step 9 there is two heads we are considering static head and seepage head now seepage head is due to the level difference between canal and drainage that is canal is on that is canal is going above the drainage or the natural river so there will be naturally there is water flowing in the canal and water flowing in the drainage so the water flowing in the canal will be having always having a tendency to seep between the aqueduct structure and it has a tendency to flow downwards so always the water will be having a tendency to flow down so what we need to understand is that the canal the canal will not be having lined sections for the entire stretch here the canal will be when the initial width of the canal that is given in the question of 30 meters during that uh, or during that section the canal is unlined that is there is soil or the bed of the canal is pervious and from that we will be there will be a transition to an impervious structure that is aqueduct so between this soil portion or unlined portion and lined portion there is a transition so at the end of the lined portion water will be seeping downward through or downward under the aqueduct aqueduct structure is impervious so water will be flowing below the structure and this water will be finally reaching in the drainage so water flows from upward canal to the bed of the drainage see this is a tricky thing so listen carefully 
uh, understand this much the water will be flowing from the unlined portion of the canal to the drainage now let us see how that happens Okay, now to find out the seepage head, we have to find out the total length of the floor of the barrage. That is, we have to find out this length. That is, we have to find out the length of the impervious floor provided for protecting the bed of the drainage. Now, length of the floor under the trough. That is, for this floor, the length under this trough will be 16.4 meters that we have found out earlier. Now, extra length of the floor to accommodate the pier nozzles. That is, to accommodate these nozzles of the pier, this protruding region, we will be providing 1 meter each on both sides, that is 2 meter. Now, horizontal length of the downstream pump, that is this downstream sloping apron, there will be a horizontal length for this downstream sloping apron and we are assuming a slope of 5 is to 1. So, this length will be 5 meters as a level difference between this level and this level is 1. Therefore. 5 horizontal is to 1 vertical. Therefore, one, there is a level difference of 1. So, there will be a horizontal difference of 5 meters. So, this length is 5 meters. Now, width of downstream cutoff beyond the ramp. So, that is for width of this cutoff that is taken as 0.6 meters and there is an extra length that is length of extra floor provided on upstream side that is this region that is 6 meters. Now, total length will be 6 plus 0.6 plus 5 plus 2 plus 16.4 so that is entire width will be 30 meters or so this is how you find out this width or if you forget just take that width or you can assume if in the worst case you can assume this value as equal to the width of the canal Okay, here the plan of a siphon aqueduct is given and this is the direction of drainage flow and this is the direction of canal flow. This is the initial region of the canal with the actual width that is 30 meters. From there, beyond this line, the transition begins and this is the contraction region and this is the plumed width of the aquifer, uh, sorry, aqueduct. Now, uh, seepage takes place along this line A, B, C, where A is a point before the start of that impervious flow or before the start of this contraction. So, A is a point at the pervious region of the canal. So, A is bef a point before the impervious floor of canal begins. From there, water flows below the transition region to a point B. So, what you have to understand is that here A, B, C is shown and it represents the horizontal creep only. We are not considering the vertical creep as it is according to the Blythe theory, we are considering only the horizontal creep. Actually, this creep or the seepage takes place in the three-dimensional system. But here we are only taking the horizontal creep. So, A to B. And B is a point below or under the barrel of the aqueduct. B is under the barrel. That is, this is the first barrel. So, which has a width of 8 meters and length of 16.4 meters. Therefore, B is at the midpoint of this barrel and this distance will be therefore 8 by 2 that is 4 meters. Therefore water flows from the unlined region of the canal to uh, through or water flows from the unlined region under the, uh, under the transition to a point at the center of the first barrel and from there water flows in the downstream direction to a point C which is beyond the impervious floor of the barrel. That is, we have designed or we have assumed the value of length of the impervious floor of the barrel as 30 meters and 
BC. B is equal to therefore half of that 30 that is 15. So A is a point at the unlined region. B is a point that is the midpoint of the first barrel and B is below the impervious floor. B situates before, uh, below the impervious floor of the barrel such that it is at the center of this barrel. That is, I will say it one more time, A is at the unlined region of the canal and it is at the midpoint of this line. So from here water flows to a lower point that is B which is under the impervious floor of the barrel and also at the center of it. From there water flows in the downstream direction B to C where C is beyond the impervious floor of the barrel or at the end of the impervious floor of the barrel. So the length of impervious floor is 30 meters therefore BC is 30 by 2 15 meters therefore total creep length is ABC which is 15 plus 4 plus this 15 so 34 and point to be remembered is that we are considering only the horizontal creep as we are designing it up according to Bly's theory. Now let us see the seepage line ABC will traverse the creep length that is ABC for ABC AB is 15 plus 8 by 2 19 BC is 30 by 2 that is a half of total length of barrel floor that is either assumed or you can find it out using the method described earlier. Assumed means if you are going to assume take that value equal to the initial canal width. Now total creep length is 34. So residual head at B that is according to Bly's theory at B the residual head is initial head that is 3.4 that is the initial seepage head that is 3.5 minus S by L is hydraulic gradient that is 3.5 mile by creep length 34 into 90 up to B the creep length is 90 therefore you get residual head at B is equal to 1.55 meters. Now hence the total seepage head is equal to static head plus seepage head that is equal to, uh, to 3.35. Now please pressure intensity due to this head is equal to 3.5 that is multiplying it by the unit weight of water 10,000 Newton per meter cube. Now this uplift will be resisted by the self weight of 0.8 meter thick slab of the barrel. So we have assumed the thickness of the uh, bottom slab of the barrel as 0.8 meters. Therefore self weight is equal to 0.8 into 24 that is equal to 19.2 kilo newton per meter square where 24 is the unit weight of concrete. Therefore balance uplift that is the remaining uplift 33.5 minus this uplift will be resisted by the self weight plus the extra reinforcement. So partially resisted by the self weight therefore the remaining uplift is equal to 33.5 minus 19.2 that is 14.3 and suitable reinforcement has to be provided at the top of the floor slab to resist this 14.3 kilo newton per now step 10 is the design of cutoff and protection box for that we have a score depth that is lacy's score depth r is equal to 0.47 into q by s all 1 by 3 so you will get this r as 3.6 meters and here f should be assumed that as 1 and q is the drainage discharge that is 450 into q per second given in the question now depth of cutoff is equal to 1.5 r that is also according to lacy's theory so depth of upstream cutoff below HFL is equal to 1.5 into R, this R, therefore you'll, that is 5.4 meters. Now reduce level of bottom of upstream cutoff, that is upstream HFL minus depth of cutoff, that is 207.33 minus 5.4, that is 201.93. Now reduce level of downstream cutoff, that is downstream HFL minus depth of cutoff, that is 201.6. Now length of upstream protection upstream protection that is uh, provided in the drain drainage you have to provide 40 centimeter thick brick pitching or stone pitching that is 2 into the length of that protection that is 2 into redu uh, reduced level of upstream bed minus reduced level of bottom of upstream cutoff that is 203.5 minus 201.93 that is equal to 3.2 meters now length of downstream protection that is equal to 2 into here RL of bed level of drain minus RL of bottom of 
downstream cutoff that is 301.6 that is length of downstream protection is equal to 5.8 meters now here this is a figure see here hfl that is upstream hfl 207.33 then downstream HFL is given in the question that is 207. Here we have defined the length of the impervious flow that is 30 meters also. This is a downstream cutoff file and we have found out the reduced level at this point. And if you are going to provide an upstream cutoff file, we have to we are <coughs> we have found out the reduced level of that pile also. Here it is not shown. Now this is a vertical drop that is we haven't provided a sloping apron at the upstream side and there is a sloping apron on the downstream side and there is upstream and downstream brick uh, brick pitching of stone protection should be provided here and here so that is that concludes the design of siphon aqueduct thank you